Welcome to the webinar, Maximizing Value, the Key to Your Best Exit. We are delighted to have terrific panelists today. I'm going to introduce both of them to you. My name is Chris Cheney. I'm with Fort Pitt Capital Group. We are the sponsor of today's event. With me, I have Lori Barkman. Uh, Lori has a tremendous background, as well as Mike Silverman. You can see that we're going to be discussing the focus of today's webinar will be strategic growth, how to actually maximize the value of your business, which gives you the best opportunity for the best possible exit. Obviously, we have legal and financial issues that we want to address as part of that. And then we have a Q&A afterwards. We invite you, if you have an opportunity, have a question, to let us know what that question is. Uh, we also happen to have a number of very frequently asked questions because we've got a lot of experience here on the panel. In the meantime, I wanna show you how to interact with your website. So if you take a look all the way down in the right-hand corner, as you can see the giant arrow pointing to that, where it says settings, you will see the opportunity if you, have, if you wanna ask questions or if you wanna pick up some handouts, they are gonna be located down there in the lower right-hand question. Uh, lower right hand corner. Um, you'll also see the top right hand side, a little pull out bar, great place to ask questions. And again, get handouts. In the meantime, little pull downs that you can see in the middle on the right hand side. So the first thing you want to do is click on that little red arrow up top that will expand your, your list of options. Then you've got a pull down. The pull down will allow you to access the questions and access, uh, type in the questions and then access the handouts. So I want to introduce to you our terrific panel today. As I mentioned before, we have Lori Barkman. Lori is the CEO of Small Dot Big, the logo that you can see right underneath her, her picture there. This is a business transition advisory firm. She's also a partner with Stony Hill Advisors. They are a mergers and acquisitions firm that focuses primarily on lower middle market businesses. So Lori is able to actually take you all the way through the transition and actually help you to close the deal. Think of her as a business transition Sherpa. She works with you to maximize the value of your company and then guides you through that complex process that's involved in letting go. She brings a tremendous amount of experience to the table. She was the former CEO of Genco Marketplace. And before that, she was an officer and senior VP of FedEx after the company was acquired, uh, the company that she was formerly uh, managing before that. In total, she's had more than 25 years of C-suite experience. She's dealt with marketing and operational uh, aspects. Lori has held leadership positions at a broad range of companies from fast growth startups to Fortune 200 companies to private equity companies. So a wonderful background. But Lori, before that, actually earned her MBA from Carnegie Mellon and a BS from Cornell University. She is a certified value builder and has a certificate in exit planning, as well as being a national Vistage speaker. So she's used to talking to business owners and leaders. On top of that, she's an adjunct professor of entrepreneurship at Carnegie Mellon and enjoys lively conversations with business owners and business leaders that you can listen to on her podcast, Succession Stories. Strongly recommend that you check out the pod podcast. It is a terrific experience. Great stories, lots of insight. We also have with us Mike Silverman. Mike is our legal expert. He is a, I've known Mike for over two decades. Uh, he is a senior partner with Denton's, Cohn and Grigsby. They're a global law firm located and headquartered right here in Pittsburgh. He graduated with an engineering degree from Johns Hopkins, has a law degree from the University of Pittsburgh and a master's in taxation from NYU. He is also a certified exit planning advisor. So he has a great deal of experience, but his primary focus is corporate law. He's able to address almost every aspect that a business owner would be concerned about, from entity formation to financing, obtaining capital, employment and non-competition uh, competition agreements, incentive compensation plans, shareholder and partnership agreements, long range business planning, acquisition techniques and exit strategies. Mike has done over 200 business transitions. So we have a tremendous amount of experience on the team today you're going to really enjoy it. At this point, I want to turn it over to Lori. Lori, take it away. Chris, thank you so much. It's great to be here today with you and Mike, and I appreciate Fort Pitt Capital bringing us together as a business advisory group. 
Um, the big why, the big why, why are we having this conversation today? My mission is to help guide entrepreneurs how to create value in your business and profit by letting it go. So profit, what does profit mean? Well, profit, if we think about it, profit certainly is monetary. You know, how do we derive more value monetarily from the hard work that we've you know, put into our companies, but then also profit by our lives, our livelihoods, our happiness, our freedom after we've transitioned from our company. So we use the word exit and transition in this context interchangeably. And one of the things I wanted to start by you know, saying, and this may or may not surprise you in the audience, and perhaps you feel the same, is that 80% of business owners are intending to transition from their company in the next five to 10 years. And what we've seen because of COVID is that number has accelerated. There's many people who feel that they're just even more ready. They were ready before, they were thinking about it, but they're even more ready. But one of the challenges is that um, many business owners don't have a written plan. About 80% do not have a written plan for that transition. And so, you know, we're all busy. It's hard to manage through things, especially when you're working in the business and not necessarily on the business. And so one of the studies that was done by this organization, the Business Enterprise Institute, they do it, they do a semi-annual, or excuse me, a multi-year survey, the last one done in 2019. And they were trying to understand what is standing in the way of your business transition or your exit. And the number one answer from business owners was need to improve the business. And so that's a big reason why we're here today to explore that aspect of how we can improve the business so that we can enjoy the profits of our hard work. So what is freedom? What does that mean in this context? Well, I just had an amazing conversation before this webinar with the owner of a $50 million manufacturing company. And his quote was just perfect. He said, he uses enterprise value as a scorecard for himself because he wants to make the company better. He wants to run a better company. And so that's one of the definitions of freedom is to have a company that's growing in value so that you can create options. Maybe those options are, you know, again, to continue to scale and grow. Maybe it's to sell, maybe it's to pass it down to family or have an internal uh, transition to management. Maybe you wanna just put your feet up and be the board chair. Regardless of what those options are, whether you're the founder or your next generation, you're looking to create transferable value to have more options. There's three types of business owners that I work with most commonly. Um, the first group are ready to sell now. They've Maybe they've gone through um, some of the exit planning and transition planning and succession planning that we're gonna talk about today, and which is great. And so they're ready to sell now, you know, now the one next year or two. The next category, are business owners who want to increase company value. They don't have a plan, as we've talked about, there's a big number of percent do not, and they want to focus forward. Um, the third category is they want a more enjoyable business to run. It can be stressful being a business owner. Um, so many of your resources, your time, and uh, sleepless nights, hopefully those are a minimum, but that can be really wrapped up in, in running a, your company. So a context, an underlying theme of today is how do we balance growing enterprise value at the same time managing risk? And the interplay between those things are re is really important and we'll, we'll give you some examples as to why that is. The first thing is to talk about the business in the eyes of the beholder, right? So if, when we look at our business, we probably see lots of wonderful things, all the strengths in our company and all the things that would, that would be a a reason why somebody would want to pay a higher price for our, for our business. But if we look at the business through the lens of a potential buyer, we start to see things a little differently. And so that's what I try to do working with clients is help them see their business through the lens of a third party. If we think about a financial buyer, what do they really care about? Well, it really boils down to um, the, the estimates of future profit streams and how reliable those estimates are. So how much profit is your company gonna generate in the future? 
and how reliable are those estimates? Because the more risk that an investor has to put into the business, they're going to apply a higher discount factor. So in this example, if we say this company has a million dollars in pre-tax profit, and a buyer is going to look at it in terms of their investment and what return on investment they need to make this work for a while. In this example, we're going to use 50% or excuse me, 15% as the percentage, uh, as, the, as the discount rate. And in just straight line fashion, over a 10 year period, the present value of this particular company would be about $5 million. So in a pre-tax profit, a $5 million net present value. But if we contrast that with another company that is a little more risky, it has a little bit different risk profile on it. And so that potential buyer is going to put a higher discount rate on it because it's the likelihood of them um, getting back those future streams of cash flows is a little more uncertain. In this case, the enterprise value is $2 million. So instead of having a 2x pre-tax profit multiple or you know, 5x, it's, it's quite a big difference. So again, it comes down to how risky is your business perceived to be. So you might say, oh, well, what are some of the things that drives that factor, you know, that risk factor or the, the upside potential. Well, there's a number of things. There's no just one answer. So, of course, like with many complicated questions, it depends. So we're going to spend a little bit of time in this discussion talking about what some of those factors are. So what are those drivers? What are the company drivers of value? Well, what we tend to see is that bigger companies get higher multiples. Why is that? Well, generally speaking, a company that's over $5 million in revenue, a company that's over $10 million in revenue, has proven the business model. They've proven um, a longevity, a, a success rate, a, a history that you can look at and, and associate, generally speaking, um, a little more of a predictability for the future. So the data that's coming in many of these slides, I just want to acknowledge from the value builder system, um, it's a system that Chris mentioned that I am uh, certified on and I use it in my practice with my clients. Um, it, it gives us a lot of wonderful data and comparisons and we can see from the data with a, a system of over 60,000 business owners that have been through, um, through the platform, a comparison of these multiples. So again, 10 million plus is going to get you a higher multiple in general than a business under a million dollars. The other thing that we see is that the industry certainly impacts your value, and you might be familiar with some of these benchmarks. And the numbers on here are, don't take them literally, you know, these are moving targets and, you know, they do change from time to time. But just looking them at them in this um, relative stacked rank, we're going to see software technology companies at the top of the list, followed by some others that you might recognize, manufacturing, wholesale trade, professional technical services, et cetera. On average, across all industries, what we typically see is, is roughly a three and a half or 3.6 times um, multiple of EBITDA. And, and then this comparison, if you look all the way at the bottom, you'd see administrative support and waste management. So you might say, oh, wow, that's a business I don't want to be in. There's really not a lot of potential there. Well, there's exceptions to everything. Um, this is Jill. She sold her administrative services company for almost $40 million. And Jill's story is an interesting one because her business, just looking at pre-tax profit, was would have been, and, and the metrics that you just looked at, looking at it as 1.8 times pre-tax profit, which would have put her enterprise value at 1.8 million. But she did something different. So Jill is the owner of Ruby Receptionist. And Ruby Receptionist, at its simplest core, if you've heard of them, is they answer phones. Um, but in the United States, where we celebrate certain holidays and certain businesses closed down, that became a challenge. So what she ended up doing was creating a technical platform that became a global solution for her to staff receptionists around the world and satisfy clients' needs. And ultimately, selling to a strategic buyer uh, garnered her that bigger opportunity. So clearly, there must be something else. There must be something else that we're that we can do to change the attributes and value of our business. So let's talk about a few of those. There's another example here. When we make decisions about our company and what services or products we offer, sometimes we make decisions about going deep and selling one product to a certain uh, 
a set of a set of customers. Or we say we're gonna we're gonna sell a variety of products and, and there's choices to make there. So I'm gonna tell you about a, a payroll services company that coincidentally in this whole story, I am a client of and I've been a client for uh, almost 20 years. But they're a payroll services company focused on nannies and home care um, people who are helping you in your home. And so you wanna pay your taxes, but you can't use a service like ADP or Paychex. They're just not targeting that audience. So this founder found a niche and at some point in her business um, journey, she had to decide, was she gonna find more parents with a nanny to sell payroll services to, or is she gonna take on different products and sell more stuff to those parents? So her name is Stephanie, Stephanie Breedlove. Eventually, Stephanie sold her company to care.com for a very significant amount of money. She sold for six times revenue. So what were some of the reasons behind that success? And was she, in that very core decision, that fork in the road where Stephanie Breedlove decided to go deep on uh, her product to selling it to parents like myself, um, she was more interested in selling one thing to lots of customers. And so in that context, I'm going to talk about customer concentration risk. So if you are selling lots of things to one set of customers, you might find that you are focused on a particular um, set of customers, which is great. You know, there might be uh, good relationships there, profitable relationships. However, if someone like a third party, a strategic buyer, financial buyer is going to look at your business, that's one of the metrics they're going to look at is what percent of your revenue is from a relatively small number of clients because that represents risk. What happens if they move on from your business? So one of the things that we look at the predictability of future cash flows also is uh, recurring revenue. And recurring revenue is different than reoccurring revenue. They sound similar, but they're very different. So recurring in the co contractual sense is an obligation. Someone's agreeing and in writing to, to buy from you. One of the most common models is the subscription model. Many of us have Netflix. We probably uh, subscribe to lots of software. And so we just see our credit cards in the system and every single month we are on that subscription plan. So buyers who are looking at technology companies, again, are gonna see higher multiples for that reason. It's a predictability of future cash flows based on their business model. So you might say, oh, well, I'm not a technology company. How in the world, how can I do that? How can I benefit from creating a recurring revenue model? That's not possible. So many people say, oh, I can't do it. They roll their eyes and, oh, that, that can't happen. Well, it can happen. There are examples of that. I'll share a couple today. One is a flower business. The flower business from these two gentlemen, Sonia and Brian, uh, they had, just like you would imagine any other flower business, uh, perishable items. There's lots of challenges in, in, in moving that inventory quickly because it's literally going to, to uh, spoil. And what they were doing was they were selling the consumers. So they're called their average order uh, in the industry is around $25. But what they decided to do was just take a fresh look at their, at their business. They stack ranked who their customers were. And what they observed is that they had uh, restaurants and hotels were coming to them on a regular basis. So what they ended up doing was creating a subscription model for business to business. And instead of having a, a, you know, a $30 average order size, they moved that to $4,500 in average order sizes and a more predictable revenue stream. So it won't surprise you to know that companies that have more than 75% of their total revenue as recurring get better offers, just makes more sense. The other theme here is about monopoly control. If any of you are um, you know, following Warren Buffett and some of his investment thesis, you may have heard about the term um, creating a competitive moat around your business. How do you protect your business from others? And one of the reasons why this is coming up today, why I wanted to share it with you is because not only are these conversations about while you're happening when you're in the room and someone's discussing with you about your business, it's actually also really important to understand the conversations that are happening when you're not in the room. And the big conversation that's happening with a potential buyer when you're not in the room is can they replicate your business? 
Can they build it or buy it? And what should they consider in that dynamic? And so with that as an underarching theme, companies that have a monopoly in their market are going to get higher offers. Again, we see this on the average offer comparison. The business that is not able to survive without its founder or its owner is pretty much a worthless business. That sounds harsh, I know, you put a lot of work and energy into your company, but if you're the owner who is involved in all the decisions, as minute as they may be, these operational decisions, or you're the owner, you know, so customers are constantly coming to you and you're firefighting. You're firefighting perhaps on employee issues. Uh, perhaps you've got suppliers you're, um, you're so close with and you have all the most important relationships with, with, with suppliers or maybe you have the most important or most um, number of relationships with your customers, you inherently are very needed. And that's a wonderful thing, right? Your business needs you. However, if we look at this from a fresh perspective, are you uh, actually working against yourself? And the concept here that I wanted to, to share is thinking about it as building enterprise value and maximizing enterprise value can be different than maximizing profits. So a company that's interested in maximizing profit might say, well, instead of hiring salespeople, I'm gonna do it myself. Or you know, instead of hiring a management team, that owner's gonna hire the lowest paid people they can find to just execute. And so while profit seeker owners are looking to grow profits, it's also likely that you're growing a worthless business. So the other concept here is the owner's trap. This, this again, you're in the middle of everything, you're selling, but then you're offering so many things because you wanna make sure your customers are happy and satisfied. And then you're the only one that can deliver it. Your team isn't trained up or they don't have the skill sets or the processes to support that. And you're the one interfacing. So it's this vicious circle. And so what happens if you're away from the business? And this is where you can chuckle and say, well, I'm never away from the business. Okay, well, that's kind of the point that you're never away from the business. It's always with you. And you know, again, people are coming to you. And so what happens if you do try to leave is the revenue is gonna plateau or the business will suffer. So we look at in this metric of who's the owner of the customer relationship. And if the answer is, it's me, and I know everybody, I know all my customers, my name, their dogs, their kids, their birthdays, well, that's lovely, and it's very personal, and it's a good thing to, to, you know, to have as an objective. It isn't going to necessarily help you in building a more valuable company. So again, owners who are able to step away from the business, one of the metrics we look at is how would your business perform if you were not there for three months or longer, that you were literally not there. You're not answering the phone, you're not answering email, you are unavailable. And you know, with COVID in the last year, I, it's made this particular question even more acutely important because let's face it, we're human, we can get sick, we, we have to take care of family, and sometimes we need to step away. But a company that cannot survive without you, again, is going to have more risk associated. Now, as we talk about other factors, there's three kind of wrapped up into one here that we call the Switzerland structure, which is what you see reflected here on the map with the, the map of Switzerland. Switzerland, as you may know, is a, is a neutral country located smack, smack in the middle of Europe. And it's this neutrality, this concept of neutrality that I want to spend some time on. Neutrality from what? Well, neutrality in the sense of if we're looking to minimize risk, there are three different groups that are really important to your business, your employees, your suppliers, and your customers. So as we think about uh, that concentration, we talked about customer concentration risk earlier. So what about supplier concentration risk? What if you have a supplier that you have an agreement today, but what happens when they go out of business? What happens to your company? We see this, you hear about it with changes with Apple, right? If you're, you have an app and it's on, the, it's on the Apple platform and Apple changes their rules, you're very susceptible to Apple's whims. And that's just one small example. 
Um, the, other, the other of the three things here would be employees. And by the way, this includes you. What happens if your most important employee is not able to work? We just talked about that for yourself. But if you stack rank everybody else in your business, it'll, it'll open up your eyes to thinking about, oh, wow, what happens if my two IC, my second in command, if I have one, and I'm fortunate to have one, if, they're two, if your two IC leaves the business, what does that mean for you? Or your, your head of sales, your head of product, your head of marketing, et cetera. And so thinking about the Switzerland structure, again, is thinking about risk in the context of suppliers, customers, and employees. The other thing we look at is the happiness and customer satisfaction. And why does this matter? Well, customers that are more likely to uh, have a good experience are more likely to come back, which means more, again, more future uh, believability of your future cash flows that you've communicated or in your, in your, in your financial projections. And so how do we measure that? Well, there's a, different, there's a lot of different ways to measure that. One way is through net promoter score. If you've gone on an airline trip recently or stayed at a hotel or bought a product from Apple or Google, they might be asking you, well, how satisfied were you in this experience? And so if you're using net promoter score, it's great. That's a great measure. Measuring over time is important so that you can see differences and changes over time, up or down. And it also gives you a sense of how you perform against different categories and loyalty leaders. And not surprisingly, companies that have higher net promoter scores are also going to garner more value. So one of the other uh, value drivers is growth potential. So your financials are important, the size of your company is important, the sense of monopoly control, the Switzerland structure as we talked about, and this is sort of in the last but not least category, which is, which is about accommodating additional demand. And, and we think about this in terms of it being, you know, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. Um, but if you want to look at crossing that finish line in a strong way, um, you know, you're going to do what you can to just sort of plow right over it. But really, it's about the person who, or the company or the acquirer, what they're going to do. So when you cross that finish line and you sold your company, it's not over. It's just beginning for the acquirer, right? It's just beginning. So we want to give a sense of, um, what opportunities, what field is left to plow as you're looking at buying that business or, you know, from the buyer's perspective. So one of the other metrics that we have is how we ask these business owners, how easy would it be to accommodate a 5x increase in demand? And that's an indication that there's still growth to be had, whether it's geographic, whether it's within your customer segment, whether it has to do with your products and innovations, whatever those factors are. And again, what we see here, and this is a quite significant difference, is between no, it's not possible to grow anymore, and yes, there's much more opportunity that will show in your multiple. So in summary, there's eight ways to maximize the value of your company. This is uh, easier said than done, I realize. And, and, and in my experience, been on both sides of business growth uh, as a value builder and advisor today, but also my past as an operator, look, I get it, right? This is not an easy thing. But also, as we look to help you um, build a more sellable business, not because you want to sell necessarily, but because this is going to give you the opportunity for the ultimate freedom, and which is choice. And um, these eight things, you know, as we've talked about all uh, in this section, really important. Um, and I hope that it gives you lots of food for thought. We're going to continue to have the discussion here in our Q&A. But I just wanted to leave you with this notion that the best time to start is now. And this quote, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best is today. And I think it's a great analogy for our discussion. So thanks. And, and Chris, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Lori. Uh, wonderful, wonderful and insightful uh, information. So when we do some, when we do planning for business owners, we look at a variety of different aspects. They all have to work together. So Lori is really focused on how we build the value of the business. And we're going to spend some time with Mike Silverman here in a little bit as well, talking about key, key steps that you need to take to lock in the value of that business, primarily legal needs. Uh, one of my biggest concerns is, uh, it's just a common experience, is the, the business has to be and serve as part of the owner's personal and financial plan. They all have to work together. If they don't work together, they will work against each other. 
and it becomes very problematic. Uh, in fact, it's very common. A lot of owners experience more than almost three quarters of the owners that the seller transition experience regret. We want to minimize regret, make this a happy experience. How do we do that? We make sure that all three aspects of these components of, of the experience work together for you. Now, this is a challenge. It is a challenge because most owners invest the vast majority of their resources, time, energy, sweat, suffering, money into their business. Statistically, it represents about 70% of the owner's net worth. That is a big challenge because you're, you need to know two things. First of all, we need to know what is the business worth and how do I know that? And is it enough? Is it enough for me to be able to walk away and write the kind of second chapter that I want to write? What if it isn't? What if there's a gap? What happens if I fall short of that number? How do I deal with, we call it dealing with the Delta. How do you deal with that? The Delta is the gap between what you have and what you need. So the first thing we need to do is to define what do you need? What is your magic number? Ultimately, this is a challenge. It's a combination of things knowing, A, as I said before, what is my business worth? How much can I really get from my business? And will it be enough for me to retire? Uh, when we say how much is it worth, it's how do you know? How do you know how much it's really worth? Because there are academic appra uh, appraisals. Uh, go to a CPA, they'll run standard formulae. Uh, or you'll go maybe to get a market-based appraisal, which will give you a better sense of what this company is worth today if we actually take it to market. And then applying all of those strategies and insights that Lori discussed can help to magnify, increase, and amplify the potential value of the business. We also want to try to estimate, and we will as you get closer towards that actual transition, what are your anticipated net proceeds? Because this is what we're going to actually be working with. How will that payout be structured? Will it be a lump sum? Will there be an earnout? Will there be a second bite at the app? All of these can make a tremendous difference in terms of the proceeds you have to work with. So you have to actually ask yourself, what do I have? What do I really have? And that means we've got to take a look at all of those assets. As you saw on the slide before, 70% of the value of, of the business owner's wealth tends to be tied up in the business. Um, we need to make sure we unlock all the assets so they're working together for you. Ultimately, it's a big question. So the second thing, once you've kind of identified everything that you have and you have some rough sense of what the net worth of the business is, we also need to define what do you really need? What is that magic number? How much do I need in proceeds to be able to sustain the kind of lifestyle that I want? This can be a big issue if you're a business owner because typically it's not unusual. A lot of owners will run some of their expenses, their living expenses through the business. You need to sharpen your pencil and decide and define exactly what am I going to continue to spend? What is purely a business expense that will no longer be, that will no longer pertain. We also want to look at outside non-portfolio sources of revenue, things like a previous pension that you may have. Those are increasingly less the case. Um, Social security benefits. What is the best possible uh, choice for you and your family in terms of uh, selecting social security benefits? Then we want to delimit the glide path. If you sit down with me and say, hey, I want to retire today, that means I've got to land the plane right now. That can make for a rough landing. So we ideally, we like to have a little bit of a glide path here. How much time do we have? And in the process of that time, how much free cash flow do we have that you're able to actually add to your outside assets, to something that's outside the business? This is really critical. So if we summarize, you know, we want to make sure that we're putting everything working together and we want to look at each individual component. That means we are going to focus on uh, anticipated cash flow. We're going to focus on expenses. What do you really need versus what do you want? It might be possible to get what you want. How can we optimize all those assets so they work together? A good plan brings all the elements of your financial picture together. That's what you see here. And we want to make sure that they all work together so that we don't have things, again, working against each other. Um, we focus on increasing the value of their business. We want to revisit those expenses, free up free cash flow so that we can place it in retirement. We want to review and maximize your non-portfolio sources of income. We want to review existing policies, insurance policies, charitable giving plans. Um, they can work for you as well. In fact, if you go into a business sale and have any charitable intent, we really need to talk because there are great tax savings that can be acquired through some pre-planning. Um, that will not only minimize the taxes you'll pay, but actually enhance the income that you can receive later. 
It depends on what you want to accomplish. We want to take a look at retirement plans. Retirement plans become incredibly important. We will look at the structure of the buyout. As I mentioned before, you know, are we going to have an earnout? Are you going to have a second bite of the apple? All of these things are very critical. Are you going to be able to consult and earn additional income afterwards? Some business owners are not able to truly step away. They want to continue to be involved somewhat or at least use their expertise to some degree. So probably the fastest and most important thing we can do is to optimize the assets that you have. How do we do that? Well, we want to make sure, as I said, to create a clear and concise coordinated strategy for each account and each set of assets that you have. If you've got after-tax assets, they need to be tax efficient and probably the most conservative assets that you have. Why? Because they come with the lowest tax cost. Your tax deferred assets, your retirement assets, the assets that you want to build outside the account, outside of the business, but are, are tax sheltered, are probably going to be the more aggressive assets because they're going to be the most expensive in terms of tax consequences. So you're going to delay or diminish the amount that you're going to take from them on an annual basis. Tax exempt assets may be the most aggressive, such as a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k. If you have irrevocable assets, those need to be structured properly too to provide you with potential income, growth, depending on what the objective is of that particular irrevocable uh, structure. The great, probably the best place to start building assets is really inside your retirement plan. Uh, it's critical to have a good, healthy, robust retirement plan. It's important not only in terms of reducing your taxable income, but providing an attractive incentive that you need to retain key employees. That helps to magnify the value of your business and it builds the tax favored assets you will need in retirement. Fortunately, we have a tremendous amount of strength in this area. We've got a wonderful expert, Nathan Box, who is able to assess your retirement plan, see if there's opportunities to either decrease expenses or increase the uh, assets and strength and viability of the program. More importantly, make it more attractive. But there's also fiduciary responsibility as a business owner that you have to the retirement plan. So we want to make sure that it really serves you and the future business potentially to the best, your best possible outcome. So ultimately, we want to make sure to optimize all of your assets based on your goals, the unique character of each account, and position them to enhance the long-term return potential. All of these different components have to work together. This is the financial side. There is an element of this that you need to consider that is non-quantitative. Uh, so we've looked at the quantitative aspects. Probably the fuzziest part, but the part that's the most important in terms of long-term satisfaction is the qualitative part. And this is something that really only you can do. Now you can do it in consultation with people that understand you best, but what is your goal for your life beyond the business? You had a life before the business, you'll have a life after the business. Ultimately, what is it that you want to accomplish and do with your time? What if you were to, if you got your magic number, if you got the number that you wanted, how would you want to spend your time? That's what's going to make for the most ultimately satisfying second chapter of your life. That's when we see people who are truly happy with both the, the success of the transition, but then the next chapter, as I said, of their life. We want to make sure that each of the three legs of this Stool, stool work together to minimize regret and maximize the value and satisfaction of the outcome. So Lori is focused on building value. I focus momentarily on a comprehensive financial strategy that helps to optimize your assets and beginning to take a look at the personal vision, your life after the business. But the last part that we really need to take a look at is how can we lock in and protect that value? And that's where Mike Silverman, who is that senior partner at, at Denton's uh, Cohen and Grigsby, is able to address some of those key questions for you. Really important. If you don't get them right, they're very expensive. So, Mike, I turn it over to you. Okay, well, in connection with designing and implementing the growth plan that Chris and Lori have described, uh, the business owner really needs to focus on how am I going to grow the value of my business? And what we typically do uh, in, in assessing how that growth is going to be attained is we initially, in step one, are going to do a deep dive into figuring out what are the unique and intangible assets of, of, of the business that give that business a competitive advantage. Uh, those assets could be in the form of unique business proprietary practices. So you have a really uniquely talented management team that's experienced. Uh, 
It, it could be your brand recognition in the marketplace. But we want to hone in on the things that give you uh, a competitive advantage in the marketplace. And then as a second step, we want to figure out, are there ways that we could further explore, exploit those intent, unique and tangible assets in that business? Uh, because if there are, then that, that will be a, a key driver for us to increase our revenue, which in turn will increase the value of the business. Lastly, we want to have you visualize the future of your business and, and assess, do a deep dive into assessing whether it makes good sense to uh, adding additional product or service offerings in the future, or maybe a developing or acquiring additional unique and tangible assets, because the implementation of those new business lines obviously can drive revenue, which in turn will drive the growth and the value of your, of your business. Uh, the, the second area that we want to focus on is really quantifying the amount of the growth and value of your business that needs to be attained. And so again, we go through a few steps in, in that exercise. The initial step is we want to know as our, our frame of reference, what's the current value of the business? And we typically will get a back of the envelope uh, valuation from a valuation firm or an accounting firm, whichever it may be. We just need a frame of reference. And then uh, when you work with Chris and Lori on the financial aspects, uh, determining what your financial goals are, uh, then we, we are, we're able to, to, to define at what valuation you need to sell your business to achieve your financial goals in connection with exiting your business. So if we have uh, the initial reference point of the current value of your business, plus we know the valuation of your business that needs to be realized on an ultimate exit from the business, there's a delta between those two numbers. And the delta is the amount of growth and value that needs to be attained. Um, that number to me is not all that meaningful. I, I, I want to break it down a little bit farther from that in that I, I want the, the, the business owner to know this is how much I need to increase my annual cash flow to attain the valuation that I need to have a successful exit to achieve my goals. So what I typically do is I, 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 I go to people like uh, Chris or Lori and, and find out what is the in industry multiple valuation multiple for, for this particular business it's used. And if I divide the amount of growth and value that needs to be obtained by that number, that's going to tell me the amount of increased annual cash flow that I need to obtain attain in this business in order to uh, accomplish the results we want on, uh, on exit. And so that's how we, we do the quantification exercise for the growth and the value of your business. Lastly, I gave you in the outline a few examples of what clients typically are doing in terms of the means of by which they're um, growing the value of their business. Obviously, we can establish new product lines, new service lines. Uh, oftentimes, our clients are hiring key employees from their competitors, uh, taking away very talented people, adding to their own management team, which adds a lot of value. They're also uh, uh, acquiring either a competitor, taking them out of the market, but not sharing market share with them anymore, or they're acquiring a synergistic business. So either one of those acquisitions is going to add value to the company. And then lastly, we want to see if we can broaden and deepen your existing product service lines. Yeah, so what we need to do, and you can kind of sense that this is a complex, um, any kind of major organic shift in, in the value of a business is a complex process. And as noted before, the more lead time, the more glide path we have, the better value we can provide. Uh, but it also requires a comprehensive team. Ultimately, we need to make sure that we bring everything together so that we put together a comprehensive coordinated financial plan. That's the first step to getting you on the path from getting from here to there. So one of the things that we wanted to do is we, we had discussed and I see we've got some questions, but we also have some frequently asked questions. I want to kind of begin with a question for you, Lori, a uh, very common question. When you talked at the beginning, you mentioned balancing risk and growth or reducing risk and maximizing growth. Uh, you know, in your experience, what is the best place to start? Where's the best place that an owner can immediately increase value or what's the easiest thing that they can do to increase value? Well, the classic answer is it depends, Chris, right? But in, in, in answering this for purposes of discussion today, I would point to the reduced risk column first because you've got to get the back office situated uh, before you can really focus forward. And, um, and that's for a couple of reasons, right? And just example wise, if you've got unprofitable parts of your business, you've got to address that. Um, you know, you can't sweep it under the rug. It's gonna, it's gonna continue to drain your resources. Those need to be addressed first. And, and with that, I'll, I'll just throw out this classic technique. Don't just look at it and on the surface. 
ask why five times as a technique to really get to root cause issues of some uh, and get to the understanding of why are those parts of your business not profitable. Um, the other part has to do with your, call it your structural capital. Um, and, and related to this is your accounting processes. Do you have and follow established accounting procedures? Um, I have some clients that recently engaged new bookkeepers. They don't have someone on staff. They, they use an outside resource, but they realize their resource was not um, up to the quality standards that they needed. You also can find wonderful interim CFO types of professionals. So I'm not necessarily saying, hey, go out and get you know audited financial statements if that's not where your business is today. Um, but on the other hand, you know you can't have the pendulum all the way on the other side, which is um, you know a messy uh, accounting accounting process. Um, the other aspect here is cash flow. You know you've got to make sure that someone's managing your accounts receivable, that you're re-looking at your policies um, and how you're invoicing and, and, and days outstanding. Um, I have a client where just quite simply, I asked him what his policy is. I said, have you thought about changing it? And it was that easy. And he rolled out in a very professional way um, a payment policy change uh, with invoicing that helped improve their cash flow dramatically. So there's some things like that, Chris, that I think are just, you know, again, in the back office, uh, structural capital category that if your business really um, is in that situation of needing to reduce risk, you might have risk associated with people. Um, you might have uh, some turnover issues that need to be addressed. Again, get to the real root issues to understand why, because otherwise, you know, if you have uh, a certain practice or people or processes that are just not working for your culture, You've got to you've got to address those. Very good, thank you. If uh, just real quick question for you, Mike. Um, you know what should owners do from a legal perspective to lock in value so they can mitigate risk or enhance value? Well, as I mentioned before, uh, I think the most valuable asset that a business owner has is the goodwill value of that business. And, that, and that's represented by all those intangible, unique intangible assets that I mentioned before that give the business a competitive advantage. So with every client that I work with, I want to simultaneously protect their existing goodwill value and also do everything I can to help them to enhance that value. So on the protection side, the, the, the threats that you have are your employees and your competitors. And so I don't want your employees walking out the door with your customers or soliciting your employees or soliciting your vendors, etc. cetera. So uh, with employees, what I want to have is I want to have an employment agreement in place with every key employee who could harm your business by walking out the door uh, with your customer list, et cetera. So the, the employment agreement with that key employee is going to have three main restrictive covenants. There's going to be confidentiality. At no point in time can you use or disclose our confidential information in the business. There's going to be non-solicitation during your employment and for 18 months after your employment, you can't solicit any of our employees or any of our customers or vendors. And then lastly, not always, but lastly, we, we try to get a non-competition provision that says that during your employment and for 18 months thereafter, you can't compete with our business. Uh, and then on the flip side, I don't want competitors taking away the goodwill value of your business. So I want to make sure that any intellectual property you, uh, that you have in your business is protected. So I want your name and logo, which is very important to the goodwill value and your brand recognition to be protected by a trademark. I want any proprietary processes that we can get patented to have a patent associated with them. And similarly, anything that we could get copyrighted that's associated with your business, I want to get a copyright in place. So that's how I protect your business. But in terms of how do we enhance the value of your business? I typically put in place for, uh, at least for the key employees, an incentive compensation plan. I want the, the employees to be incentive to grow the value of your business, to grow the revenue, to be growing in the same direction that you're growing. And so there's typically one of two types of plans. There's either a phantom stock plan or a stock appreciation rights plan. And either one of those plans provide that to the extent the value of the business increases in the future, we're going to pay to you as deferred compensation, which, mind you, is deductible by us because that's wages. We're going to pay to you as deferred compensation a percentage of that growth. It typically is somewhere between 5 to 10 percent of the growth, so that most of that growth endures to the owner. Um, but that will incent the key employees to uh, grow the business and to be 
uh, rolling in the same direction that you are. Lori, I, you, you had mentioned earlier the, the owner's trap, and I, I know the legal steps that we, we, we employ to address the owner's trap, but uh, from a coaching perspective, what do, you, what do you do to fix this? And can you give us some examples of someone who was successful uh, in escaping this trap? Yeah, that's one of the uh, things I said earlier is that I know entrepreneurs are so motivated to make their business successful. And the challenge in, in, in really being so involved in the business is that at the same time, that motivation might be holding you back. So what, I, what I've what i worked on with some clients is helping them see where they can um, create processes to replicate what they do. They won't, you'll never be you, right? We're not trying to clone you, but we're trying to at least have a process around that. So with one client, we are creating a sales process. They didn't have a sales process before. Um, he would be the the rainmaker primarily through established relationships. Um, they didn't have a formalized sales process to do um, competitive analysis and uh, you know targeting, positioning, and prospecting, and then going through all the pipeline stages. So they would kind of jump from one to the next and hopefully close a deal, but it was more sporadic rather than purposeful. So that's that's one example, but I think the true test goes back to this question that we like to ask in this uh, in our value builder assessment is, you know, what would happen if you weren't in the business? And um, Chris had mentioned in my, in my introduction that I'm a, a, a speaker with Vistage and I do these workshops. I travel around the country and I talk to CEOs and business owners, and it's amazing, you know, to hear stories. One story was there's a business owner who set himself on that mission to make himself replaceable. And over the course of a two year period, he uh, was very purposeful about his time away. So at first it was one day and then two and then three, and you can see where this goes. And eventually it was 90 days and he worked his way up to that. And he had told his people, when I am out, I am out. Do not call me, do not email me, I am not available. And you know, as you can imagine, it was very hard at first, but over time, the business um, kind of built itself around that and, and eventually, um, and I think his intent is to sell the business and you know, thinking about his succession. So that's, a, that's an extreme example. And then on my podcast, I've talked to, I've talked to owners and CEOs who are in this situation. One is a, is a show that's coming out soon with Nelson Anderson and, and he's in Baltimore. Um, he runs a company called Full Sail Media. And when he first got started with his printing uh, companies, uh, he ended up buying more and more of these franchises and these small businesses, but he was stitching them together. At one point, he told me he had 25 direct reports. <laughs> That's just not sustainable, right? So uh, Nelson in that situation realized it was just not going to work and putting in processes, training people, understanding uh, what processes are repeatable, uh, how to scale, putting systems in place. That really seems to be a common theme uh, of an approach to how to get yourself out of an owner's trap. One of the exercises that I did with a client recently was I call it the skill fun box. And you take a look at how you're spending your time and you break that down. And then you look at whether or not you have the skills for that activity, right? Really inherently, are you just doing it or because you've, uh, you, you know how that process works? Um, and the other side of that, of that matrix is, do you enjoy doing it? Right? So you might be good at it, but you hate it. So why are you doing it? <laughs> and so you can ask yourself with these questions of Skill Fun Box. So that's an exercise too, where I've helped, I'm helping one of my clients really figure out how she wants to spend her time, because then she can figure out in terms of um, the team around her and who she needs. She had an unexpected turnover. Her second in command, her two IC left a little prematurely. They weren't necessarily expecting it. And it caused some disruption in the business. So again, as you think about yourself and your role in the company and where, how you want to be spending your time, if you want to start putting your feet up, if you want to have a little less stress in your day, then um, we're going to start to look at your processes, your human capital, et cetera. Boy, Laura, that's fantastic. You know, it's interesting in, in talking to business owners, oftentimes, as you pointed out, they're firemen, uh, firefighters, uh, constantly putting out fires. They're oftentimes the best employee. Uh, and I often have used the analogy of a, of a baseball team. If you've got a fantastic pitcher and you're trying to use that pitcher to be a mediocre shortstop, you're, not, you're, you're replacing a great shortstop somewhere and you're ruining your pitcher. But ultimately that's what business owners do. And when they can refocus on what they do best and what they love, 
they get a new lease on life, and more importantly, they also get great talent in those other spots, which can expand the business and build value. So that's a great way to transition out of that uh, that owner trap. Um, of course, that's that's on the coaching side, and that's critical. But there are also legal issues and legal concerns. So, Mike, can you give us an, an example of how a legal solution has increased the value of a, of a business and what was involved in that? Well, a, an example of that would be a company that I represented. Uh, I represented the owner of the business, and uh, her business was worth about $5 million. This was uh, about five years ago. And um, uh, we, we were giving uh, thought to how, how we could get the business from its current value of $5 million to she wanted to get to a value of 8 or $9 million. And I strongly endorsed uh, implementing a stock appreciation rights plan. And the stock appreciation rights plan simply says that current value of the business is five million dollars. For every dollar that we appreciate in value, you key employees who are participating in this plan will get a percentage. In this case, we had four key employees who, in the aggregate, were participating to the tune of ten percent, and they got ten percent of the appreciation in value upon a triggering event, which would be a sale of the company or them having vested and retired at a certain age, etc. Uh, they would get that as deferred compensation paid to them at that time. And so what ended up happening is we sold the company last year, pre-COVID, uh, the beginning of last year for $9 million. It had in a five-year period appreciated in value by $4 million. And I, I believe the stock appreciation rights plan played a key role in that. We paid, paid to the key employees 10% of that $4 million of appreciation as deferred compensation. We got a deduction for it, so it didn't cost us 100 cents on the dollar, it cost us maybe 60 cents on the dollar after deducting it. And uh, my client, Chief, Chief, pocketed an extra $4 million of uh, purchase price, so she accomplished her objective. So I think that worked out pretty well. That's impressive. So you got tax benefits, $4 million of additional value. I, I would say whatever was spent was pretty well spent. So that was a good investment. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. Um, so, Lori, you mentioned one thing that was really that really intrigued me, and I've heard this before too. You know, some industries enjoy higher multiples than others. Uh, the issue is kind of how do you migrate, or how do you expand the business so it can participate in other sectors that might enjoy a higher multiple? Have you seen this happen? Have you been able to facilitate this? Can you give us an example? Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's interesting as you think about it, right? Where we had technology companies at the highest uh, multiple rating as we look down the down the chart and um, there are examples of companies that have transformed right where they uh, one example is a, um, a micro filming business right which is obsolete and at the time they knew they were becoming obsolete but what they ended up doing was transforming into a technology services company where they were then working with companies to help them um, take all their paper and digitize and, be, and created a recurring revenue model off of that. And they ended up selling, uh, I don't know the exact number, but for a multi-million dollar valuation, uh, all cash exit in, in a couple of years ago. Um, and so in that case, you know, that's an, that's an example of a company that faced disruption. And by the way, one of the quotes I really like is disruption starts with unhappy customers. So one of the things we need to do is we look to need, we've got to look beyond um, are kind of these self-imposed boundaries uh, of what your industry is doing today and try to look beyond that. So another example would be manufacturing uh, or industries that are sitting on AS400, you know, these old name frames. What kind of data do we have? How might we unlock the potential of that data? How might we utilize that to create um, uh, revenue, new revenue streams, recurring revenue streams um, as an example you know, can we look more like a technology company because of the business model that we're able to create? And one of the things that, that I do, Chris, and that my value creation work with companies is I am partnered with a data analytics firm uh, that's experienced in developing solutions for machine learning, artificial intelligence. So how can we help companies monetize the data that they have? And again, look more like a company that has a recurring revenue model or use that data to further improve their operations, become more efficient and effective. And that's regardless of, of any industry that you're in. So what I would do here, really answering your question, is tie it back to the drivers. And if one of the drivers that we're looking for is a competitive moat, or if another driver is the you know recurring revenue streams or predictability, then that'll help lead us down the path to a solution. 
Lori, if, if you're trying to maximize the value of a company, how much time do you feel that you need to work with that company to get them to their optimal or best result? Well, having more time is better than, than, than not having enough time. And I, that's what I hear consistently in every interview that I do. And I've done more than, I've done almost 70 at this point with CEOs. And, and everybody says the same thing, that they wish they had more time. So in an ideal fashion, Mike, I think it's two to three years out at a minimum, you know, if you're really starting to think about it and thinking about a transition. But if you, you know, take back to what I said from this uh, quote from the gentleman who's running a $50, $50 million manufacturing business, he's in his early 60s, but he has been um, just thinking about enterprise value as a scorecard for, for decades because he knew ultimately it was going to help him in creating a more profitable business and it just makes economic sense. So if there's a somebody thinking about a transition in the near term, one to two years out, yes, absolutely, let's get started right away. If you're two to three years away, two to five, you know, I think that that's great and I think that's ideal. Excellent. I, thank you uh, to both of our panelists and thank you to everybody who's been participating and listening. Um, we hope this has been tremendously valuable. We want to make we want to help you make lots more money from your business and through the business. Um, and the great thing that we all love about dealing with business owners is not only are business owners wonderful people who invest themselves in everything they do, but on top of that, uh, the, as you can tell, they're great stories. They're life's challenges. These are the dramas and, and adventures of life. So we're the three participants. I do want to share a few more important things with you just to kind of give you a little more background about who we are. Again, we all work together. We're part of a, book, a collaborative uh, venture, part of a collaborative group called the Business advisory group. Now, this is collaborative. Uh, we work with a, a variety of experts, both within the group and outside the group, but we have a lot of experience and work together extremely well to be able to enhance and magnify the value of your business and the uh, outcome that you achieve. In the process, we'd love to talk to you. You can certainly reach out to us on each of our websites. Uh, you'll see um, some information about us. Uh, I know on the Fort Pitt uh, Capital Group, uh, website. We have a landing page. We have a page where you can find some more information about us. Please reach out. We'll make sure that you get in touch with the right person, but you had the contact information before on the previous page as well. Now, Fort Pitt Capital Group, uh, as well as Denton's Cone and Grigsby and Small Dot Big, all of us work together on a variety of different uh, objectives, a variety of different um, uh, projects. So if one of us is able to help you, we'll certainly connect you immediately with the other. One of the things that we try to do on a regular basis is continually bring to you the best available information that's out there. Uh, we've got another webinar coming up fairly soon. Will college costs wreck your retirement? Anybody who's got kids and is concerned about the expenses of college, very expensive, expensive, will know that this is a critical issue. How do I balance the cost of college with my retirement goals? Beyond that, I will also tell you that we've got webinars coming up in August, uh, dealing with your brain and money, how, how your head gets in the way of your pocketbook and your wealth. Uh, further webinars in the future will deal with special needs, charitable giving. We wanna make sure that you've got the best available information to make the best choices so you can make the most of your money. I, I mentioned before and earlier on that I had the privilege of actually being a participant on Lori's wonderful podcast, Succession Stories. You can see it here on this slide. Um, it was a terrific experience. Lori, you made it just an absolute delight. Uh, and I've enjoyed listening to other of these podcasts. And as I said before, you get these wonderful stories of business owners and their challenges, the insights. It's a lifetime worth of experience, all sort of distilled for you within a very accessible moment that you can listen to at your own convenience. I strongly urge you to check out Succession Stories. Great podcast. And last and not least, I want to let you know, obviously, uh, you know, Fort Pitt, we, we provide direction, we provide advice, we function as fiduciaries, uh, but we want to make sure that you understand, uh, you know, we are obviously registered with the SEC. We've got a variety of important uh, compliance. We always make sure to cross our T's, dot our I's, make sure we're doing the right thing for you at all times. So incredibly important. Uh, we'd be delighted to serve you and work with you in any way possible. Feel free to reach out to Lori, to Mike, to myself, to the Business Advisory Group. We're absolutely delighted to have had this time with you. Thank you so much.